Dear friends, welcome to a new unit of study in the ongoing program in journalism and mass communication. This unit deals with the history of print and broadcast media in India. It is important for the students of journalism and mass communication to know what had been the phases of the evolution and development of the media in India in the past after independence and before independence since it is only this knowledge that can make us see things in the right perspective and make us foresee with some confidence as to how things would be in the future. India is today the world's largest democracy. Its mass media culture, a system that has evolved over centuries comprises a complex framework. Modernization has transformed this into a communications network that sustains the pulse of a democracy of about 1.1 billion people. India's newspaper evolution is nearly unmatched in the world's press history. India's newspaper industry and its westernization go hand in hand. India's press is a metaphor for its advancement in the globalized world. As we begin a journey to the past, first let us have an overview of the landmarks in the development of print and broadcast media in India. The evolution of the Indian media has been fraught with developmental difficulties, illiteracy, colonial constraints and repression, poverty and apathy. All these have thwarted the interest in news and media in some sections of the society. Within this framework, it is instructive to examine India's press in two broad analytical sections that is pre-colonial times and the colonial and independent press. Broadly speaking, the events of these two landmark periods can be put in some broad segments as we will learn. The first segment is the pre-independence era. Because of the poor literacy rate and much less number of English readers, those working for English newspapers understandably had in mind the British during this time. They also had in mind the Indian nobility and the bureaucracy as their readers. Expectedly, such newspapers laid stress on social activities of this section, giving much space to parties, fashion trends, social events and so on. English newspapers from that period are known for carrying advertisements and features reflecting this trend. An example is that merely being seen in the company of a British officer was considered worthy of being covered in a newspaper. As far as Hindi and other language papers were concerned, these were mostly brought out with little resources and with committed people writing columns, opinion pieces and editorials reflecting regional or community aspirations or referring to the activities of the pro-freedom activists. The second phase is the period from independence to 1965. After 1947, it was an era of supporting the new government and its components and the press was reluctant to be too objective, lest it be branded as pro-Raj. Since the government of independent India meant one particular political formation of party, most of the contents in the press during those years were one-sided. During this period, only one political party mattered in the scheme of things and other political forces were in disarray. Two wars, one with China and the other with Pakistan, had left the nation and the people in a somber mood and the population in general not only believed in one political party 
but actually wanted to go along with its policies in the new found post independence period. An example from those days would be the fact that any journalist or any news item that was critical of the ruling party, the Congress or the government was branded as being a Raj sympathizer having a Raj hangover. The third phase was the period from 1965 to 1975. The consolidation of the post-independence euphoria continued in this period with most newspapers supporting the supposedly welfare moves such as abolition of zamindari, privy purse, nationalization of banks, strengthening of the public sector and tightening of controls over private and foreign business. It also saw the golden period of the Indian armed forces when they spearheaded the creation of Bangladesh in the erstwhile East Pakistan. But these events culminated in the emergence of an authoritarian ruling elite in India. It led to the declaration of the internal emergency in 1975. During this period, it was the first instance that the press in India faced a clamp down. Also, India started having some kind of a voice in the global arena with the emergence of the non-aligned movement. The impact of left-wing political thought was strongly evident in government policies and other non-Congress political formations had slowly started gathering support in some corners of the country. An example of these times was that any journalist or news item that criticized the government was dubbed a CIA agent. The next period lasted for two years from 1975 to 1977. This was the period when the nation was under an internal emergency following the then ruling elites belief that political and electoral reverses amounted to a threat to the nation's internal security. The state of emergency continued for about two years and the period saw several unknown facets of our people and society. The disgruntled people welcomed the new regimented work culture but resisted attempts to restrict individual freedom. The coercion seen in the family planning movement led to several stories that aimed to create hostility among communities. The press in general cowed down before an oppressive regime and there was no shortage of publications that eulogized the Indira Gandhi regime of that period and its policies restricting civil and individual rights. At the same time, a parallel movement quite like an underground press also survived that braved the state repression, but its promoters suffered hardships and were even jailed, and yet they continued to raise a voice in favor of a free press and restoration of the civil rights. Remarkable examples of this era are the state-sponsored slogans supporting the government's reasons for imposing the emergency. These included the ones on the importance of discipline that said Anushashan hi desh ko mahan banata hai, mera bharat mahan and chota parivar sukhi parivar. Instead of becoming part of the national lexicon, these slogans became butt of jokes in the underground area and in discussions in the civil society. Next is the period from 1977 to 1991. A general election immediately after the emergency was lifted led to a landslide victory for a conglomeration of all non-Congress political parties and led to the total rout of the Congress in Parliament and in most states. Iconic politicians fell at the hustings, insignificant leaders rose to become important personalities and even ministers in 
the center and states the period was marked by the emergence of a multi party political culture there was growing alienation between the ruling elite and the masses there was a growth in the middle class an increase in brain drain and there were demands raised for liberalization of the economy events in the rest of the world for the first time started mattering to indians and things such as the gulf war petro dollar global community global business importance of technology the non resident indian and multilateralism became relevant to the average indian examples of social behavior of this period are the growing emergence of casteist surnames religious biases and jobs in the gulf leading to an exodus of skilled workers from many states the next phase is the time from 1991 to 2002 it saw the advent of economic liberalization disinvestment privatization dilution of government control globalism arrival of foreign products and services exposure to latest technology opening up of the media and the airwaves new trends in entertainment information technology marketing attitudes breaking of taboos and restraints and of course the arrival of the internet some typical symbols of this period included the emergence of use of mixed language or english use of provocative clothes and permissive behavior and statements that were accepted without batting an eyelid that meant breaking of taboos and the next phase is the present we we refer to the past one decade that has seen unprecedented growth of the economy opening up of various sectors and of lifestyle as well growing influence of foreign investment products attitudes and new age jobs the period is also marked by the emergence of the new media especially the world wide web mobile telephony networking without wires innovative use of the media and entertainment in marketing of products and services and a general air of globalization changes in all aspects of life have been so rapid and striking that it is difficult to mention what would stand out as different if anything it would be a great sense of freedom in all communities use of handheld devices and technology across the classes and masses and the great influence of television on people's lives along with a, a, a convergence of political thought and divergence of political ideology at the same time with this perspective we shall now have a look at the milestones in the history of indian media the indian media as we understand consists of several different types of communication such as television radio cinema newspapers magazines and of course internet based websites indian media was active since the late 18th century with the print media having started in 1780 radio broadcasting initiated in 1927 and the screening of august and louis lumiere moving pictures in bombay initiated during the summers of 1895 the media in india is among the oldest and largest in the world indian media and the private media in particular has been free and independent throughout most of its history the period of emergency as mentioned during 1975 to 1977 was the only brief period when the media in india was faced with potential government retribution 
the country in 2007 consumed 99 million newspaper copies making it the second largest market in the world for newspapers by 2009 india had a total of 81 crore internet users comprising 7.0% of the country's population and about 75 lakh people in india also had access to broadband internet as of 2010 making it the 11th largest country in the world in terms of broadband internet users as of 2009 india is among the fourth largest television broadcast stations in the world with nearly 1400 stations so first let us talk about the print media and the timeline of the evolution of media in india the printing press preceded the advent of printed news in india by about 100 years it was in 1674 that the first printing apparatus was established in bombay followed by madras in 1772 In the early period newspapers in India were run by the British under the British rule India's first newspaper the Bengal Gazette which was an English weekly also known as Hickey's Gazette or Calcutta General Advertiser was published by a gentleman named James Augustus Hickey on January 29 1780 from Calcutta It was the first newspaper in the entire South Asian subcontinent. Hickey had his own column and many persons wrote with pen names. It was started as a two-sheet newspaper specializing in writing on the private lives of the sahibs of the company that is the East India Company. Hickey dared even to mount scurrilous attacks on the governor general Warren Hastings wife which was soon landed the late printer to the honorable company in trouble hickey was sentenced to 4 months in jail and was required to pay rupees 500 as fine which did not deter him after a bitter attack on the governor general and the then chief justice elia impe hickey was sentenced to 1 year in prison and fined rupees 5000 which finally drove him to penury these were the first tentative steps of journalism in india and the bengal gazette could not survive for more than 2 years after that then came the calcutta gazette as a rival to the then deceased bengal gazette published in the same year that is 1780 by b messink and peter reed who were its plant publishers backed by Warren Hastings after the Bengal Gazette other publications which started from different cities in India included the Madras Courier Weekly in 1785 the Bombay Herald Weekly in 1789 which merged into Bombay Gazette in 1791 the Hurukaru Weekly in 1793 Calcutta Chronicle in 1818 Bengal General Indian World and Bengal Harkara etc It was followed by another private initiative the Bengal Journal the Oriental Magazine of Calcutta Amusement that is a monthly magazine which made it imperative to publish four weekly newspapers and one monthly magazine published from Calcutta so calcutta has grown as a big publishing center in those times in madras that is now chennai the madras courier was started in 1785 richard johnson its founder was a government printer madras got its second newspaper when in 1791 hugh boyd who was the editor of the courier quit and founded the hurkaru tragically for the paper it ceased publication when boyd passed away within a year of its founding 
It was only in 1795 that competitors to the courier emerged with the founding of the Madras Gazette followed by the India Herald. The latter was an unauthorized publication which led to the deportation of its founder, the Humphreys. The Madras Courier was designated the purveyor of official information in the presidency of Madras. The first Hindi daily, Samachar Sudha Varshan, began in 1854. In 1878, the Hindu was founded and it played a vital role in promoting the cause of Indian independence from the colonial yoke. Its founder, Kasturi Ranga Ayangar, was a lawyer and his son, K. Srinivasan, assumed editorship of this pioneering newspaper during the first half of the 20th century. Today, this newspaper enjoys the highest circulation in South India and is counted among the top five newspapers nationally. Bombay, that is Mumbai today, was surprisingly a late starter. The Bombay Herald came into existence in 1789. Significantly, a year later, a paper called The Courier started carrying advertisements in Gujarati language. The first media merger of sorts was when the Bombay Gazette started in 1791, merged with the Bombay Herald the following year. Like the Madras Courier, this new entity was recognized as the publication to carry official notifications and advertisements. Patriotic movements grew in proportion with the colonial ruthlessness and a vehicle of information dissemination became a tool for the freedom struggle. In this struggle for freedom, journalists in the earlier 20th century performed a dual role as professionals and nationalists. Indeed, many national leaders from Gandhi to Vajpayee were journalists as well. Calcutta, Madras, Bombay and Delhi were four main centers of urban renaissance which nourished news in India. It was only during and after the 70s, especially after Indira Gandhi's electoral defeat in 1977 that regional language newspapers became prevalent and strong. There were nationalistic echoes from other linguistic regional provinces, Bengal, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Punjab and Uttar Pradesh produced dailies in regional languages. Hindi and Urdu were largely instrumental in voicing the viewpoints and aspirations of both Hindus and Muslims of the northern provinces as communalism and religious intolerance increased before and after the partition, Urdu remained primarily the language of Muslims as Pakistan chose this language as its lingua franca. After partition, the cause of Urdu and its newspapers suffered a setback as some elements began to recognize the association of Urdu with Islam and Pakistan. As for Indians, Indian people's involvement in the publication industry, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, the pioneer Indian journalist and social reformer, inspired Gangadhar Bhattacharji, a social activist, to publish the Bengal Gazette in 1816. It was the first Indian-owned English daily newspaper but could not survive long. Raja Ram Mohan Rai's own publication was Sambad Kamadi in Bengali in 1821, Mirut ul Akbar in Persian in 1822 and the Brahminical magazine in English in 1822. The British government imposed press regulation in 1823 in India to control newspapers. The regulation was used as a tool to deport James Silk Buckingham, the editor of the Calcutta Chronicle. The Raja presented a petition to Supreme Court to protest against the regulation in favor of Buckingham. 
it was this bold step of Raja Ram Mohan Roy for the preservation of press freedom, but he was defeated in the court at that time. Meanwhile, some fundamentalist elements published Samachar Chandrika Weekly to challenge Raja Ram Mohan Roy's social reforms. The uprising of 1857 was a turning point in Indian journalism. In the issue of this so-called mutiny, the British-owned press and the Indians-owned press blamed each other at the lowest level. This event then fueled the Indian-owned press against the British rule in India. Pioneering Indian journalists of those days included, of course, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, Gangadhar Bhattacharji, Bhavani Charan Banerjee, Dwarkanath Tagore, Girish Chandra Ghosh, Harish Chandra Mukherjee, Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar, Krishtro Paul, Manmohan Ghosh, Keshab Chandar, etc. Other major publications by Indians included The Reformer, The Enquirer, Gyan Anveshan, Bengal Herald, Bang Dut, The Hindu Patriot, Indian Mirror and Sulab Samachar among many. After 1857, the Bombay Standard, the Bombay Times and Telegraph merged to give rise to a new entity known as the Times of India in 1861. Robert Knight, a British gentleman, was its owner. He was also the owner of the Statesman Daily from Calcutta during 1875, the Indian Economist Monthly and the Agricultural Gazette of India. His editorials and writings were considered to be very balanced and impressive. Other major publications in this later part included the Hindu Prakash Weekly, Gyan Prakash, Lok Hitwadi, all in 1861, the Amrit Bazar Patrika in Calcutta in 1868, the Pioneer in Allahabad 1872, the Hindu in Chennai 1878, the Keshari in Marathi and the Maratha in English both in 1878 from Pune launched by the veteran freedom fighter Bal Gangadhar Tilak and the great Indian journalists of that time included Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Mahadev Govind Ranade, Dada Bhai Noroji, Gopal Rao Hari Deshmukh, Vishnu Shastri Pandit, Karsan Das Mulji and Bal Shastri Jambhekar among the many more. The British government enacted the Vernacular Press Act in 1878 to suppress the Indian language newspapers. After the establishment of the Indian National Congress in 1885, the Indian press became an important part of the struggle for independence. The leading newspapers after the establishment of the Indian National Congress, that is 1885, included the Bengali English Daily edited by Surindranath Banerjee in 1900, the New India English Weekly in 1901, Bande Mataram, both edited by Bipin Chandrapal in the same year. In 1906, the Yugantar, Bengali Daily. In 1909, the Leader from Allahabad, edited by Madan Mohan Malviya. The New India, edited by Annie Besant in 1913. The Bombay Chronicle, edited by Feroz Shah Mehta in 1913. Justice, edited by T. M. Nair in 1918, which was published by the proponents of the anti-Brahmin movement in Madras. The Searchlight, an English bi-weekly edited by Shachindranath Sinha in 1918. The Independent, edited by Motilal Nehru in 1919. And The Young India, edited by Mahatma Gandhi also in 1919. The Navjeevan, a Gujarati weekly by Mahatma Gandhi, 1920. Swarajya, a newspaper edited by T. Prakasham in 1922. And Forward, a magazine edited by Chitranjan Das in 1923. In the same year, that is 1923, came the Hindustan Times, 
edited by the noted editor K M Panikkar. It was the first daily brought out from New Delhi. In nineteen twenty nine, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose came out with a newspaper named Liberty, and in nineteen thirty two, Mahatma Gandhi started publishing a Gujarati weekly named the Harijan, and in nineteen thirty eight. Jawaharlal Nehru launched the English newspaper National Herald from New Delhi. In 1907 there were a series of arrests and prosecutions against the Indian journalists and the Indian press. The India Press Act was enacted in 1910 and it asked for heavy security deposits from newspapers. as many as 963 publications and presses were prosecuted under this act and 173 new printing presses and about 129 newspapers were killed before they could be published the british government is reported to have collected a huge amount of about 5 lakh indian rupees in the first year of the enforcement of this act and this amount is astronomical considering the period then came the first world war in 1914 to 1918 it saw the indian press divided on the issue of the indian stand in the war the act of the government was used as a tool against the presses who were not in support of the british side in the world war the period of 1920 to 1947 can be termed as the golden era of indian mission journalism the press declared a non cooperation movement against the british rule in india it marched shoulder to shoulder with satyagrahis and other nationalists mahatma gandhi came out openly for freedom of expression ideas and people's sentiments in his papers and writings he did not accept any advertisements and he believed the newspapers should survive on the revenue from subscribers only he also would not accept any restrictions on the paper and would rather close down the publication his writings were widely circulated and reproduced in the newspapers all over the country his endeavor was a big challenge to the non gandhian newspapers he declared the salt satyagraha in 1930 in which the nationalist press played a memorable role it is perhaps unique in the history of any freedom movement anywhere in the world when the second world war broke out british rulers became more suppressive on the indian press in 1940 the state government in uttar pradesh directed the press to submit the headlines of the news to the secretary of the information department for his pre approval in response to this the national herald which was a newspaper run by jawaharlal nehru published the news without headlines while the second world war and the freedom struggle in india gave more fuel to the indian press the british termed this press as being pro hitler the all india newspaper editors conference at a meeting held in 1940 in new delhi raised its voice against the suppression and the suppressive attitude of the british government however a fresh wave of suppression and struggle started from 1942 onwards when the quit india movement was initiated many presses publications and journalists including nehru were suspended and arrested in 1942 this continued until the declaration of independence in 1947 k ramarao editor of swaraj newspaper has said that during those times it was more than a vocation or a profession it was a mission and the newspaper was a noble enterprise working for patriotic purposes 
India received independence from the British on August 15, 1947 and the press celebrated the independence because it was their victory also. In the initial years after independence, the relations between the national government and the press were good, but a year later the situation changed. Jawaharlal Nehru and Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel were among those leaders who were not very happy with the press. Still, measures to give a structure to the Indian media continued and the first press commission set up in 1952 gave its report in 1954. Its recommendations included the setting up of a press council of India, <coughs> setting up of a registrar of press in India, implementation of a minimum basic salary for working journalists and strengthening the role of the editors. Among the legislations enacted in this period were the Working Journalist Act in 1955, the Newspaper Price and Page Act in 1956 and the establishment of the Press Council in 1965. The transition from mission to profession has been quick and sure. Whereas journalism in the post-independence period underwent qualitative changes, its extent also grew. The country's desire to have self-rule having been fulfilled, the focus of the media now shifted to developmental activities. During the pre-independence period, It was a fight against the British rule in which the press also contributed. Activities had to be pursued by the media also to arouse public opinion against the British Raj which was considered to be the cause of all national concerns. The Raj was the adversary against which the Indians had to stand up as it meant inviting the wrath of the powerful adversary those fighting for the national cause were bound to suffer the crusade against the foreign rule therefore meant perpetual preparedness to accept sufferings without feeling let down that was the mission of journalism in those days however in independent india the adversary was gone in its place was a national government with bright and venerable leaders of the freedom movement as ministers and decision makers journalists suddenly found themselves in the company of rulers they were no longer required to nurture a feeling of skepticism against the administration instead a feeling of sympathy for the new administrators was natural to grow in the hearts of journalists as many of them shared common ideals and social background with the present rulers the missionary spirit of journalism could not be sustained under the changed situation and under the new dispensations during the british rule all resources to run the national press had to be generated by the activists themselves organized industry had no reason to be attracted to running newspapers which was anyway not a profit making business many editors and journalists who had taken up the cause of publishing papers to guide freedom fighters and creating public opinion did not survive even for a few years the situation changed after independence while the old anglo indian papers changed hands and were now controlled by indian industrialists such as the times of india and so on new units were started to meet additional requirements of the reading public publication of newspapers now became like any other industry rather more prestigious because of the immense power that it brought in the hands of the owners who became controllers of information sources the growth of newspapers during the british period was an 
uneven process. Service conditions and emoluments of workers had no standardization. Even in the Anglo-Indian press and the prestigious Associated Press of India, a news agency, the wage structure of employees completely depended on the attitude of the employers. The technology of communication and printing was at a very primitive stage. Today's journalists would hardly understand that reporters working during those days had to write their news telegrams in block capital letters to be dispatched through telegraph offices. Morse code was the only way to transmit these telegrams and newspapers were printed in letter presses. All this was a cumbersome process requiring a lot of space, a lot of time and of course a lot of patience since the machinery for newspaper printing processes was not manufactured in India and was largely imported from European countries. It was a very expensive venture and yet many industrials in India did continue to publish newspapers. In the absence of satisfactory wages and any clout attached to the profession, journalism did not attract careerists desirous of making a career and making legitimate money. It was something for those trying to involve themselves in a thankless job for the sake of idealism and it was such people who stuck to this profession. Also, journalists those days were not necessarily highly educated in the formal sense though they were invariably wise persons with high moral values and dedicated to the job that they had voluntarily chosen to carry out. That high moral values and idealism of life did not depend on education alone was a lesson rarely learned from the life of several of journalists of that period. Also, invariably, they were efficient persons. Lack of formal education was supplemented by a strong desire to acquire knowledge from wherever possible. They were men of learning and good readers at any cost, unlike many journalists of the present era who seldom read anything except perhaps their own newspapers. The service conditions of workers could be gauged from the fact that even allowing a some kind of an annual increment in the wages of a journalist was not necessary. Many reporters during the initial years had to work for several years on fixed and constant wages. Independence although brought a definite change in this situation. There was this Working Journalists Act and then followed an era of wage boards constituted by the government. Wage structure was substantially improved since the wage boards were a tripartite body consisting of representatives of the industry that is the employers, the employees through the employees union and of course the labor department of the government. Also as the journalists were now privileged to rub shoulders with top politicians and bureaucrats, the profession acquired a certain prestige and clout. Gradually, they came to a position to influence the decision-making process of the government because they were in any case familiar with the people who were running the government, the bureaucrats and the politicians, as well as the systems that had gone into the working of the government. During the first phase of the post-independence era, the Congress party enjoyed unchallenged superiority in politics because of its prominent role in the country's battle for independence. To remain in the company of Congress leaders, therefore, was itself a great prestige. While there were journalists who had been associated with Congress ideals since their early life, 
those joining the profession later found it helpful to rise in their careers by championing the cause of the Congress. Journalists therefore slowly started becoming a part of the establishment itself. To criticize the Congress policies beyond a point was likely to be dubbed not in tune with national spirit of those days. The situation helped in the emergence of a new tribe of journalists who were in the profession not because of any commitment to ideals. Journalism was now like any other job with improved wages and added prestige though direct monetary gains were still not very attractive. New establishments especially in the field of weekly magazines started their ventures during the period opened fresh avenues for aspiring young journalists of those years. This started an open debate whether journalism was a mission or had become like any other profession. While the old school of journalists continued to emphasize that theirs was basically a mission, the new entrants disputed their claim. Within the first two decades after independence, however, the dispute was settled in favor of those who accepted it as a profession. The concept of a mission was now a thing of the past. There has been a clear division between commercial and aesthetic expression in the media over the years. Today's mass communication media seems to be exposing its message to all possible variants even as the old media are becoming more and more permeable to blogs and other such universally accessible means of conveying information. This phenomenon is not due to a fascination in more democratic information sources. On the contrary, the pressure is rising due to the growth of the eyes that is the cameras and the new digital devices including the mobile phones which are equipped with the eye of a camera. These eyes are watching the same events that the mainstream media is reporting to us. The possibility of being uncovered is quite large and broadcast journalists are forced to tell the truth or at least a plausible version of it and as a consequence blogs have become a major source of news and information about many global affairs. We also have to consider that bloggers are very often the real journalist at any, any level as they <coughs> at their own risk provide independent news in countries where the mainstream media is censored, biased or is under control. <coughs> Here there is a special mention about the legacy of Uttar Pradesh. The state of UP in its strengths, weaknesses, its conservatism, its inertia and unwillingness to change very often helps us to gauge the mood of India itself. <coughs> This representative character of UP <coughs> was evident during the struggle for India's freedom and it could be enough to understand the patriotic zeal of national leaders from UP and the repression let loose on freedom fighters by the British in UP to understand what was happening on the national scene during those turbulent years. Northwestern provinces, as the state was called during the pre-independence period, initially had its capital at Allahabad, the home of the Nehru's. The center for the state's political and social activities was transferred to Lucknow at a very later stage. Allahabad thus represented both the might of the British Raj and the enthusiasm of the national movement 
it was the veritable arena of the battle between the two sides as in politics so in journalism this clash was evident between those trying to consolidate the raj and others equally determined to throw away the yoke at allahabad a newspaper called the leader represented the fire of nationalism while another english paper called the pioneer represented the ruthlessness of the anglo indian power journalists in those times were political activists in many cases those in the nationalist press always ran the risk of inviting the wrath of the government but they were ready to bear the consequences of challenging the might of the british raj the anglo indian press was the blue eyed boy of the raj while the nationalist press that often included hindi and other regional languages publications fought for justice the anglo indian press took pride in threatening and cajoling those trying to raise their voice against the then administration the leader had been established by patriotic and public spirited citizens of allahabad most of them were advocates in the high court led by pandit madan mohan malviya among the founders of the newspaper leader were pandit motilal nehru sachidanand sinha and dr tej bahadur sapro motilal nehru was the chairman of the first board of directors of the leader the first editor of the leader newspaper cy chintamani was a top figure in public life of india during those days he edited the paper besides functioning as the leader of opposition in the state's legislative council for nearly a decade the pioneer on the other hand was owned edited and managed by englishmen noted writer radyard kipling was its assistant editor for some time the british leader of those times winston churchill wrote for this newspaper the pioneer from the northwest frontier covering the afghan war while he was serving the british army as a subaltern the paper the pioneer had no sympathy with the nationalist cause and was little bothered about the people's problems as were its contemporary anglo indian papers in calcutta and bombay the pioneer served only the english elite the english press however did not serve the masses because of the inability of majority of people to communicate in the language that is english of course the leaders trying to awaken india about the people's rights and privileges were from the english educated classes this is an irony they owed their idealism to the liberal western democratic thoughts and the policies of liberalism preached by european philosophers the number of such leaders however was limited the middle level activists of the congress and the vast mass of people in rural india whose power alone could move the government under the charisma of gandhi had little or no knowledge of english to inspire and educate them there was this role played by the hindi press and its journalists whose history also goes back to the beginning of the last century and earlier the hindi newspaper aaj of varanasi and the pratap of kanpur were the most noteworthy hindi daily newspapers of this state which played a very prominent and dominant role as makers of public opinion journalism in those days was quite different from what it appears and represents today 
newspapers were mainly news papers and editors were more of guiding forces and educators communication system was still at a very primary stage and tries transmission of news took a long time a much longer time was taken in actually producing a publication since the technology was cumbersome took a lot of time and the skilled workers that were required to handle those big printing presses were difficult to come by in fact most such workers used to work in two or three places to deal with one publication or books or magazines in many places and the worth of newspapers was assessed on the basis of the stand they took on public issues to criticize the government of the day was not free from risks and those trying to challenge the british power always ran the risk of being jailed presses were seized and heavy fines imposed on those confronting the administration editors and journalists however took pride in undergoing sufferings for the cause of their conviction and their sufferings only consolidated their support among the masses in fact the aaj of varanasi emerged as a symbol of people's aspirations under the editorship of the noted writer and journalist babu rao vishnu paradkar who has become a memorable name in hindi journalism and often cited as being the father figure in hindi journalism in india one of his subordinates during those days was pandit kamlapati tripathi the well known freedom fighter and congress leader of the country who also went on to become chief minister of uttar pradesh and a minister in the central government the sacrifice of ganesh shankar vidyarthi to the cause of communal harmony at kanpur has similarly become a landmark of indian history of freedom struggle vidyarthi is equally well known for his public spiritedness and the cause of national reconstruction as for his fearlessness and devotion to the profession of journalism the journalists of uttar pradesh therefore were inheritors of a great legacy this legacy was a legacy of selflessness courage of conviction dedication to truth and fearlessness even during the british period eminent journalists gave more importance to their convictions than to an organization or a viewpoint babu ra vishnu paradkar himself was a staunch nationalist but he never hesitated in criticizing the congress if he felt there was a need to do so journalists commitment to political parties and leaders was a development of a later stage coming after about two or three decades after independence and the emergence of a tribe of journalists throwing professional commitment to the winds for pecuniary benefits was a development of a more distant stage with this we come to the end of the discussion on the history of media in india to recap we saw that the media in india india is among the oldest and largest in the world it played a key role in the freedom struggle when the top leaders of the national freedom movement were involved in writing and educating the masses also immediately after independence the government itself took several measures to give some kind of a structure to the profession of journalism and the media industry which led to journalism being more of a profession rather than being a mission which it was in the pre independence era in the next lectures we shall move on to a different period and also to the evolution of the electronic media that includes radio and television till then happy reading and best wishes